The scale of this scandal is remarkable. Around 350 victims have reported child sexual abuse within UK football clubs to the police. Greater Manchester Police alone have identified 10 suspects. And the NSPCC's dedicated helpline has confirmed it received over 860 calls in its first week. We're frankly staggered at the number of calls that have been made to this dedicated NSPCC helpline since it was set up a week ago. It is unprecedented in our experience of, of setting up a helpline like this to get so many calls in such a short period of time. Several people have told the BBC that they were abused by this man, former North West based football coach Frank Roper, who died in 2005. Jason Dunford says he was one of Roper's victims while a youth player and told me today how he felt having learned about his abuser's death. He was so aggressive, he was certainly one that had to be brought to justice. I was angry at first and now I'm looking at the positive. Now I've slept on it, I'm looking at the positives of him uh, not being able to affect my life or anyone else's life anymore. Meanwhile, it's emerged that Chelsea in the last three years made a payment to a former youth player who claimed he was abused by the club's chief scout in the 1970s. An internal inquiry is being launched amid reports other big clubs may have made similar payments. When asked about the consequences of clubs engaging in any cover-ups, the FA was clear. We have clear laws um, and rules in the game that need to be followed and if there's been any evidence of a breach of those, so hush, you know, hushing up would be one. Subject to due process, i.e. the police need to be you know, the right place in this. When it's our turn to apply the rules, we absolutely will. Today, former Newcastle United footballer David Etook told the BBC he was abused by the club's former youth coach, George Ormond, who was jailed in 2002 for indecent assault. There's a lot of uh, shame, a lot of guilt attached. A lot of confusion um, and like I say there was just impossible at that time to uh, to come out just in, in, impossible and with more players set to come forward the appalling secret that British football appears to have harbored for so long is finally being exposed Dan Rowan BBC News well, with us now is Pete Saunders from the National Association of People Abused in Childhood. Pete, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, we've had conversations like this on, uh, for, for other reasons, but the, the scale of the uh, abuse, the number of people coming forward, how shocked are you by it? Um, well, as you know, I mean, we've spoken about these issues so many times over the years, haven't we, Martine? And, um, and I fear that we'll be having these conversations again. I, I've sort of... It, it, no, nothing really shocks me anymore and um, I was talking to your colleagues earlier and mentioning that I I'd spoken to a, a Premier League soccer player some years ago a very well known former soccer player who who said this was about eight years ago said I think quite a few of the lads that I play with have, have suffered the stuff that you deal with you know after I told him about NAPAC and and his words were so prophetic because this is now coming out and we've had institution after institution but the reality is and, and these people the, the victim survivors need a lot of support you know NAPAC has seen a huge hike in calls to our free phone helpline just in the last 10 days we've seen um, almost 50 percent of our calls in the last 10 days have come from men which is very unusual because normally men are in the minority but obviously these brave soccer players that are coming out and speaking are kind of giving permission and li liberating people, if you like, to come forward and to speak out and to feel, at long last, to feel safe that they can speak out. And, and you know, people are ringing NAPAC every day and telling us that. So what does that say about the change in society's attitude towards victims of abuse then, if people are feeling able to come forward on this scale? Well, I, there has been a big change. There's no, there's no question of it. I mean, I'm not sure to what extent our children are safer today than they were in the past, but certainly now that we've got the internet, now that we've got so many colleagues in the media who are um, discussing these, story, the, these, these experiences and, and giving airtime to, to people to come forward, I think people genuinely feel now that it, it isn't quite the taboo that it, that it was, and, and hopefully, we, by more people coming forward, it, it'll be less of a, of a stigma, if that's the right word, you know, because so many men and, and women find it incredibly difficult, Martin, to talk about these issues. These are historical cases that we're, we're tending to hear about at yeah. the moment, though, and you say you don't think necessarily children are any safer today, that the number of sort of 
perpetrators out there could be as big, if not more. But how, better, how much better are we at protecting our children and knowing what the risks might be? Well, I, you know, I don't want to cause panic by saying all our children are at risk, but a significant number of children are at risk because the, the, the sad and tragic reality is there are a lot of people, there are a lot of perpetrators out there in society who are quite determined to hurt children one way or the other. And so we've got to do an awful lot of work to understand where that disgusting, sordid behaviour comes from, so what to do about the perpetrators. And I would say, Martin, to send out a very clear message to people who are considering hurting a child that if you do it, you're going to go to prison for a very long time. So I think we've got to have zero tolerance on these crimes. But we've also critically got to support the many survivors who are coming forward because many people are broken and, and they are not able to lead and live a decent life that everybody should be able to. And there's so much more that we need to do and as I say NAPAC is a small organisation as you know and we're struggling not just not to make ends meet but also to meet the huge demand of people coming forward so there's a lot to do. Some very senior police officers have talked about the sheer scale of what they're facing and how Simon Bailey for example the National Police Lead on Child Protection and Abuse Investigations talked about a couple of years ago about how they're having to rearrange their resources to try to deal with this. Yeah. Phil Gormley who was the Deputy Director General a couple of years ago of the National Crime Agency mm -hmm. saying we need to think carefully about how we approach this offending behaviour and the propensity of quite large numbers of people in this case to view images. Yeah. Yeah of child abuse. Yeah. What do we do? We can't, if, if we can't arrest our way out of it as the police think. Sure. Well, I, I, I think saying that we can't arrest our way out is a very dangerous message. I think people who abuse children must know, and they will know, that the police will track them down. So, you know, don't, don't send, we shouldn't send out a message that the chances are they won't get uh, uh, apprehended. But I think Theresa May, when, when she was Home Secretary, made the very, very good point that the abuse of children is indeed, and her words were, a threat to our national security. You know, we invest a lot of money in all sorts of other areas of crime. This, for me, is the most serious crime on the planet, and it's certainly the most serious crime to the individuals involved whose lives are destroyed by rape and abuse. So there's so much more that we've got to do, and I'm hoping that our current Home Secretary, who, who does seem to get it, will uh, address these issues of resources for the police and, of course, resources for charities like ours. Yeah, I mean, how do the charities like yours and, and others, the NSPCC, uh, how do they cope with this tidal wave mm. of, 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 of calls for help? Well, it, it, in a word, we, we don't. I mean, the NSPCC is huge compared to us with, with massive resources compared to, to us, but I know that they still struggle to, to kind of meet the demand for the work that they they do. So I think it has to be a, a serious discussion about how we reorder our resources to tackle this most prolific crime in our society, uh, certainly the most prolific serious crime in society, which is the rape and abuse of children, alongside, as I say, support for those tiny uh, and in our case relatively small organisations who are just battling every day to try and stem the tide and to try and help those who do get, mercifully get through on our free phone helpline. Pete, good to see you. Thank and, you very much for coming And you, here. Martin. Pete Saunders from the National Association of People Abused in Childhood. Thanks. Uh, some breaking news to bring. 50 victims have come forward to report child abuse at football clubs. Greater Manchester Police said tonight that they are investigating reports from 35 victims, about 10 different su suspects. The New England manager, Gareth Southgate, today revealed that he was once a teammate of an ex-professional who has spoken out about what happened. Sky's David Bowden reports. When the FA hierarchy took their seats at Wembley, for Gareth Southgate's first media outing as full-time England manager, they knew it was only a matter of time before talk of team selection and tournament failure gave way to the real topic haunting English football, sex abuse. You're of an age where you would have been playing professional football at the same time as many of these guys who've come forward saying they were abused. As a player, did you hear anything about it? Was there any changing room chat about it at all? No, I, I think, um, you know, I played with one of the players who's recently come forward and 
the reality of that, as they have said, is that they haven't felt able to speak about that until this moment. Um, and, and that's completely understandable. Um, and of course, with the benefit of hindsight, you always relay then things that you've seen from the past and, and have a, an understanding of, oh, okay, maybe that's why we saw things we saw. So I think it's a very difficult situation. I think the world was very different 20 years ago. I think it, it is important we acknowledge that and learn from it. This is Gareth Southgate at Crystal Palace, playing alongside Paul Stewart, who learned just this week that the man who abused him as a child, football coach Frank Roper, died 11 years ago. In truth, I'm probably not as devastated as my immediate family, my wife and my children, because I think they wanted retribution, if you will. I don't want to dwell on Frank Roper any more than I have done over the 41 years since he started uh, abusing me because he's already taken uh, my childhood and a big part of my life away from me so I'm not giving him the opportunity to, uh, to carry on taking my life away. What began as just one man's story of how he was sexually abused as a young professional footballer has turned into the biggest crisis the game has ever seen in this country. An NSPCC hotline has already received almost 900 calls and it was only set up a week ago. The FA is keen to point out that young players are better protected from would-be abusers now than they've ever been, but is defensive about whether it's doing all it can to root out the truth of what went before. We're making sure that every, every club up and down the country, of which there's 20,000, make sure that they're fully understanding and aware of the things that they need to do to ensure that these good practices we've got in place continue. So I think we are being proactive. Gareth Southgate's next game as England manager isn't until March, by which time all connected with football in this country must hope the revelations about child abuse in the game have been addressed once and for all. David Bowden, Sky News, Wembley. And the football abuse story also features on the pledge tonight. The former FA chairman Greg Dyke and England international Graham Lasso are both on this week's panel and they were asked whether this is now the biggest crisis facing football. I don't, I'm not in a position to judge whether it's the biggest crisis. I can say in the three years that I was chairman of the FA, while we discussed safeguarding quite a lot about what, none of this ever emerged. So we were not, you were not aware of this. And if you look back in the history of this, uh, I'm not sure you're talking about the period that we're in now. I think you're talking about a period 20 years ago. Yeah. From my point of view, the coach, any coach, was somebody that you had to buy into what they were telling you because they're the ones that could make you better. Mm. And therefore, they had all the power. So with that power comes an incredible responsibility. You know, for well, you me, I was that coming you over run through walls for your yeah, coach. Absolutely, you wrote that in your piece. And, and and you know, for me, I was coming over from Jersey to England with various clubs and whatever. You're in an environment where you are vulnerable, um, and the protections clearly weren't there. And if anything had happened to anyone, as we're finding out now, there was nowhere for them to report that. Yeah. Football sex abuse scandal reaches 350 complainants. Manchester police alone are investigating 10 suspects. Good evening. The sexual abuse scandal enveloping British football is already on a huge scale and rising by the day. 100 more cases today and new names of suspects surfacing with them. Nobody yet knows the true extent of it, but already the sport will be forced to review the safeguarding of young footballers when they come under the control of adult coaches. Tonight, the latest. Now, already 350 people have been reporting alleged cases of child sex abuse connected to football clubs. The number has been rising by the day following the launch of an NSPCC hotline, which has received more than 860 calls in its first week of operation. Greater Manchester Police alone say they've received reports from 35 individuals and have identified 10 suspects. And as the numbers rise, Channel 4 News tonight names another football coach who victims say may have abused dozens of young boys. Our sports correspondent, Kamian Zerum, has this. Now Channel 4 News can name the man victims say abused them. 
football coach and now named by victims as a child sex abuser, Frank Roper, here on tour with a team of young boys. Last night, for the first time, victims revealed that an unnamed coach abused young boys in the Blackpool area for years. But Roper took his secret to his grave. It means for his victims and their families, it's not the closure they were hoping for. He took my childhood away and he's taken away a big part of my life. I'm, 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 I'm determined not to let him, dead or alive, take away any more of my life. My wife and children were probably more disappointed than me because, you know, they, they, they were angry, um, bearing in mind that they only knew the extent of what happened to me over the last couple of weeks. So they wanted revenge, I, w I would say, or retribution. So, you know, they it devastated them more than me. And in the Northwest, victims have told us that they believe their abusers were working together in youth football to target victims. Paul Stewart says Roper justified his own behaviour by telling him he knew another coach did the same thing. Yeah, that, that was more or less what he was, uh, what he was trying, to, trying to say, you know, and, 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 and how matter-of-factly he said it, you know, when I look back, just, just disgusts me. This is a scandal that's affecting everyone in football. Paul Stewart used to play at Crystal Palace with a youngster called Gareth Southgate. Stewart confirming to Channel 4 News he is the man the New England manager unveiled today spoke of in his very first press conference. You know, I played with one of the players who's recently come forward and the reality of that, as they have said, is that they haven't felt able to speak about that until this moment. Um, and, and that's completely understandable. Channel 4 News has been told of two men Roper's said to have abused who've yet to come forward, and at least another 30 who've personally told this victim that Roper abused them too. Jason Dunford says, please, if you can, speak out. We got through the worst of this, and now it's important that for future generations of our children and your children, that we now come up with a preventive uh, message and we come up with preventive methods to stop the future generations having to go through what we went through. This is now surely the biggest investigation into historical child sex abuse this nation has ever seen. In all, 17 police forces are now looking into allegations. They've received 350 reports to date. And the NSPCC hotline, set up a week ago, has received 860 calls, more than the one for Jimmy Savile. We're, we're coping OK with the numbers that are coming through, but uh, it is unprecedented and we have been staggered, frankly, at the volume of, of calls, concerns that have come through. Where does it end? In Newcastle, another victim of convicted paedophile George Ormond spoke today on how being abused destroyed him. You know, when I first signed for Newcastle, I was unstoppable. I was, you know, fully, fully filled with confidence. And from that moment, um, you know, it left a big kind of space um, you know, for me to, to feel really low, uh, really low confidence. Um, so, yeah, it was a horrific moment. And the impact on these grown men who bottled up what happened in locker rooms and showers for decades is still untold. I've suffered enough. Um, um, I want to move forward. Um, people are asking me, has this helped? I don't know yet. I'm two weeks down the line. Uh, I haven't yet been out in public, uh, if I'm honest. So, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got to get back to some normality. But what is normal when no one knows how many more of these terrible secrets football still hides? Came in, Zaren. In a moment, we'll talk to presenter and journalist Charlie Webster, who was abused by her running coach when she was 15. But first, from Norwich, we're joined by Chief Constable Simon Bailey, who is the lead for child protection on the National Police Chiefs Council. And Simon Bailey, um, I'm wondering, do you have really any sense of how big a task you've got ahead of you? Well, I think we can see from the numbers that are already in the public domain that we have a really significant task ahead of us. Uh, we are already looking at uh, 350 potential victims and I suspect that those numbers will increase and I would certainly encourage uh, any victims that have yet to have the confidence and courage to come forward to look at the numbers of people that are coming forward 
and, and follow their lead. Uh, I think it's really important that we understand the true scale of the challenge that we are dealing with, but most importantly, we, are, we uh, ensure that the people that have been abusing them are no longer in, in a position to be able to carry on that abuse. Well, I mean, uh, Manchester police are saying they've got ten suspects they're looking very closely at already. Do you have any sense of, of that kind of a number? No, and I think those numbers, those numbers will increase. Uh, there are, as you know, 17 forces. It involves 55 football clubs, ranging from both the professional clubs and the Premiership right down to amateur grassroots clubs. So in the first few days, we've seen incredible numbers of reports coming through, both to the police service, to clubs themselves, and, and to the Football Association, NSPCC hotline. And I suspect that those numbers will continue to grow in the next few days and weeks. This is sensitive and difficult work. And I mean, you yourself are uh, somebody who, who knew about child protection before, but there are going to be officers having to deal with this. Who, who have not really been in this sort of work before, because it's surely beyond the scale of with what you're really equipped to deal with. Well, with, through Operation Hydrant, which is the National Police Chiefs Council's uh, coordinating body, we will be coordinating the approach across the police service to this. We will be deconflicting investigations, and we will certainly be making sure that senior investigating officers across the country are provided with the, uh, the appropriate support. Uh, their first thoughts and focus is going to be on ensuring the safeguarding arrangements are in place to make sure that abusers can no longer abuse and they will then be prioritising investigations to make sure that victims get, get the right outcomes. We are obviously dealing with a, a number of years. In some cases, I suspect that abusers will already be serving custodial sentences. Some may well be dead. So there will be a sense of prioritisation and a coordination across the service and certainly through uh, Operation Hydrant, I believe we are well placed to do this. We have specialist yeah. officers who are trained to be able to deal with these investigations and will listen very sympathetically, very carefully to all allegations of abuse. And I would certainly encourage all victims to have the confidence and courage to come forward. Chief Constable, if you could stay with us for a moment. Um, let me turn then um, to you, Charlie Webster. Um, you were not abused as a footballer, you were abused as a runner. And I think your point really is that it, this is time not just to stop at football, but to look at the relationships in sport generally between coaches and young people? I think even further than that, John, because um, I think we've reported that it's a big problem for football. It's not a problem for football, and it's not really a problem for sports. It's a problem which transcends all of sport. Um, yes, I was abused in running. Um, the incredible courage of the footballers coming forward were abused in football. But it's not just a coach. It's a position of power against somebody who's vulnerable, which is why, why it tends to be um, children. And it happens in institutions where, that happen, where that's able, where there's power and where there's vulnerability. So not just in sport, running football. It happens, we've, we've heard, in churches, uh, te in teaching, um, in any position where there is that relationship. And it's really important that we understand what sexual abuse is. Um, because sexual abuse can happen to anybody. It can happen to a male or female. It's exactly the same act. And it, it, it's a manipulative, it's cold, it's calculated. And the person who is the perpetrator doesn't show this thing on their forehead where they're this creep or weirdo. They tend to be very nice um, to the out, outward public. And they tend to be sometimes put on pedestals, especially coaches, especially in grassroots sports. Um, my coach was seen as somebody who was pivotal to our community and he was helping young girls achieve their dreams. And I'm sure a lot of the coaches which uh, have been abusing the footballers, it's the same thing. They're seen as, you know, these amazing people which are really helping young people achieve their, their dream. And This clearly has to be a watershed for society at large, precisely for the reasons you spell out. Um, but the question is, you've really got two points. One is to bring people to being able to talk about it and, and, and tell what actually happened to them, uh, to the police and, and, and to the NSPCC. But the other is what you do after that. I mean, do you now have to think in terms of chaperones and all sorts of other resources to, to, to safeguard children in these circumstances? Uh, I think that, the, the, you know, there are so many different things. I think 
Firstly, you're right. I mean, I've been talking about this for a long time now. Um, I waived my anonymity two years ago, but even before that, I was campaigning. I was working with um, victims in SARC centres, sexual abuse rape centres, and I think it's amazing that these victims have come out because it will maybe change the conversation once and for all that it happens to both sexes, which I think is very important. Mm. It's not gender-specific. And also that it's a wide societal problem that's mm. actually... <clears throat> disgusting and horrendous and while we kind of turn a blind eye to it we're covering it up you know the society is just mm. as bad because we are we're covering up it up and ignoring it so i think again the definition of of what it actually is is really important because i remember somebody saying to me well shouldn't the parents look out for them and it's like well i didn't walk home and there was no signs of me i probably covered it up i didn't walk in the the room as kind of like crying my eyes out and also i didn't really know what ha what happened so i think education is pivotal mm -hmm. to it not just safeguarding and not looking internally at at football clubs or the fa or governing bodies it can't be an internal investigation it's got to be something outward mm -hmm. and we have to learn from historical abuse you know, we've seen Jimmy Savile, we've seen the football cases now, and we need to create a safe forum mm. for victims to come forward and feel confident to without being vilified themselves. Well, Chief Constable, I, I mean, the problem, of course, is that we already have a child abuse investigation going on into historic cases anyway, and that has been terribly fraught with difficulties. Are you confident that this could be a moment when the police uh, will be able to, in some way, to crack this? And, and leave us in a situation where perhaps we can deal with this much more effectively in the future? Well, I, I, don't, I think I mean, I'm very confident around the police service's response to this, and there is no doubt it has got better over the last few years. And I think that is amply demonstrated by the fact that more victims are having the confidence to come forward. But I'd really like to pick up on the point that Charlie's made in terms of how we as a society build resilience amongst children and young people so that they understand when they are potentially subject to exploitative mm. relationships or as somebody's trying to abuse them. And the fact is that by the time a victim has the confidence and courage to come forward and report their abuse to us, it's too late and the damage has been done. And society, we have now got to start reflecting upon all non-recent abuse across all institutions, be it within the church, within education, within care homes, within football or in any other environment, and say, how do we go about preventing this in the future? And my view is that by creating resilient children, resilient young people that understand where they are being abused and potentially being exploited is perhaps the greatest significant step that we could take towards achieving that aim. Chief Constable Simon Bailey, thank you very much for joining us. And Charlie Webster, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.